What we are here for is, is to cover eschatology. Dr. Noe has written, how many books you got underneath your belt? <laughs> 19. 19. Wow. He's got 19. And counting. And counting. And he's got three in the works. Okay. Um, so to, to be of the senior age, and we're not going to talk any numbers now. Eternal. Okay. Eternal age. Okay. Um, this is a, an example of a lifetime of a man who has investigated this topic, I don't know, 30, 40 years. Not just a couple of years reading the Bible, but he's been studying this stuff. Yeah, 40 years of studying this stuff. He has an earned PhD in theology, and he's going to tell you a story of the difficulties that he had with that getting that degree. Because that degree that he got and his dissertation centered around eschatology. He took a lot of flack to get that degree, a lot of flack. And for those of you who know about getting a PhD, it is not so easy. Okay? Um, so he's here tonight to answer Patty Oswald's question about <laughs> synthesizing eschatology. Okay. She's my wife. She's smarter than me, Dr. Noah. You, you and I have a lot in common. <laughs> now, we, as we you know, know, we've covered eschatology. I think we've had five sessions on it. And I've really laid out a, a various possibilities for understanding end times or an end time or an end to an age. Okay. I have told Dr. Noe that you're sufficiently edified to go to the depths that he can go. But he, he will probably go there, and I think you'll be able to stay with him. His eschatology happens to be PIPS, P-I-P-S. John, what does PIPS stand for? Gladys Knight. Preterist, idealist, postmillennial synthesis. Okay. Now, next week when we come back, it's our last meeting, but I'm hoping that you will come up with your own acronym based on everything we've been through. John happened to come up with preteristic, idealistic, postmillennial synthesis. Okay? And he can explain that and he can defend his holding of that biblically. He can defend it, okay? So what I would like for you to do is that this coming week, I'd like for you to think about, okay, what, what really do I believe, okay? And, uh, and, and create an acronym out of that quagmire stuff, which you'll see in a few minutes, of all of those words, okay? And you come up with your own eschatology. The last time John was here was June, 20, June 6, 2021. How many of you were here when he was here? Okay, so you, you remember him, okay? Um, so with so it that... So like, looks like I ran a few off. You ran a few off. <laughs> um, John and I were talking today about how unique this, this is, what we're doing here. This, this is, and even John's, you, 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 where are you going to do this? How are you going to talk about different views of eschatology in your church? It's going to happen. You can't do it. You can't, you can't have an objective, not subjective, an objective study of this. Okay? So I'm, I'm happy John is here. I'm glad he made the, the, the journey. You know his pips. You just had that. He is the author of this book, Unraveling the End. John, how did this book happen? How, how did you do this? What, what motivated you to do this? Well, this was post my dissertation, PhD dissertation. And it's based upon that. It's based upon that. Turn around a little bit. Oh, okay. Excuse me. 
the Anderson Church of God, which is a headquarters church of the Church of God, one of one of several churches of God, but that one, located in Anderson, Indiana, which is about 30 miles northeast of uh, Indianapolis, asked me if I'd be willing to come up and lead a 13-week seminar on Wednesday evenings uh, on this topic of, of uh, unraveling the end, is what we called it then. And, uh, and I, after I picked myself up off the floor, couldn't believe any church would allow to do something like that, and uh, in which at, uh, in which we would be looking at the four major views in evangelical Christianity, uh, all of which are armed camps that, that that are prepared to defend their position to the death almost, and 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 to discredit anybody who would come against them. That any church, let alone the headquarter church, would be willing to do it. And audio and and um, audio it, not video it, yeah, but yeah. audio it and put it on their uh, church's website and kept it up there for a couple of years after after it was over. And uh, we 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 had about I think I think we'd average sixty to seventy a night, something like that. And uh, it was quite a quite an enjoyable experience for everybody. So you had to prepare for this, mm -hmm. and it was 13 weeks. 13 and weeks. out of this preparation, you put together some notes or outline, which, off, which led you to ultimately write this book. Is that what happened, John? Well, has anybody ever seen a PhD dissertation? Does anybody in here ever, ever know what one looks like? Here's what mine looked like. Can you can you imagine presenting that to a church group? Now that's the cotton edition, which is a, which it, which is a single page. Hold it up, Brian. Hold it up. And now, if you got sticky stuff, if you got sticky stuff on your hands, please do not touch the cotton. Pages. No, no, that's all right. Just that's that, that, that's the that's the that topic. Yeah. That's the yeah, topic. Pass it around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Be careful. Now the seminary, the, 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 the seminary has the other topic, but that's in their library and uh, and so forth. So, uh, wow. so anyway, right. what, 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 Zach, when, when was that written? May I ask? Uh, uh, that was written in two from two thousand to two thousand and three, and was and was finally approved. Uh, in 2003. So you did your PhD a little more midlife rather than earlier in life. Yes. Yes. I did. Wow. I did. Okay, so so you, you just learned that that dissertation ultimately led to this book, okay? That research... Well, it led, first of all, to the seminar. To the seminar. And right, then the, the seminar... seminar led to come to this, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Led to that book. Because you don't want to publish that thing. As uh, Stan Gundry, head of Zondervan, told me, he said, nobody wants to read a PhD dissertation except those people get paid to do it. So and me, and he advised me, me, says, do not publish your dissertation. So let me go to another thing, John, so turn around and look mm -hmm. at the screen. Okay. okay. Your life background then has been, as a scholar, at least the last 40 years, You've been into this stuff. You, you've been into it. Longer than that. Yeah. Okay. Um, you've been to the ETS, that's the Evangelical Theological Society. Have you presented papers, Dr. Noe? 19. 19 papers. All around presented. the country and, and, uh, and All in around Canada. The country. Yeah. Okay. And so have these papers that you've presented the ETS, they've been, most of them, eschatological in, in most of them? Uh, yes, on eschatological issues, most of them, yes. Okay. Tell us about the challenges that you faced in getting your PhD. What happened before you went before all these guys? What happened, John? <clears throat> well, let's see. Where should I pick it up at? Uh, in my book, The Apocalypse Conspiracy, came out. In 1991. <clears throat> 1991. 
if some of you remember back then. Uh, another book came out, or excuse me, I got to get the dates right. Another book came out called 1993 by a guy by the name of Harold Camping. Anybody ever recall that name? <coughs> Guess what that book was about. Now this is 1991, and the title of the book is 19, excuse me, the title of his book was 1994. In 1993, the uh, uh, Larry King Live, which was the top show on C CNN back that time, watched by over 100 million viewers live every night, contacted me and wanted me to, wanted to fly me to uh, Washington, D.C. to appear on, with Larry King and another guest, which I found out later was going to be Harold Camping. Oh, wow. Again, this is 1993. And his book was titled 1994, and the reason they wanted to do it now was because that was right in the middle of Waco. How many remember Waco? Waco, yeah. The tragedy there. And how many people were killed when the feds burned yeah. it down? Yeah. Something like 60 or 70 or yeah, yeah. whatever. And wanted me to come on there to refute him. So I went to my pastor, told him what was going on, what they wanted me to do. What do you think he said? <laughs> then don't do it. So Larry is a secular Jew. All he wants to do is get two Christians on there to create a bloodbath and discredit the cause of Christ for, in front of over a hundred million viewers live, plus all those that would watch later reruns. Don't do it. And what do you think I felt? You wanted to do it and let it happen. Let, it, let them have it. <laughs> I decided to do it. But I also decided that that was not going to happen. So I got, so I, they picked me up at the airport, uh, picked me up in a limo, took me to the airport, picked me up in the limo from Washington Airport, drove me to this nice old brownstone hotel. And a little down, louder, a little louder. A little louder, okay. In downtown, uh, not downtown, but uh, the old part of Washington, beautiful. Uh, drove me by the White House, showed him that and all that stuff. I'd seen that before, but anyway. Uh, <clears throat> and then took me to, pick me up later, because the show that at that time was, was aired live at 8 o'clock Eastern. And they, 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 they brought me into the green room. Now, now the green room, uh, they don't put the two people that are going to be on opposed to each other in the same green room, because they don't want you kibitzing with, with one another there. And, you know, they wanted you to save the fireworks for the show. You're going to get in a fist fight, do it on camera. <laughs> and this was back, if you remember, 1993, 90, because this was March of 93. That was right before they, they burned, the feds burned the, the, the Davidian complex down. Uh, that, that was when interrupting people and shouting was not popular yet. Well, Harold didn't know that. Mm. But, but, uh, so anyway, so Larry introduces us and kicks off. Oh, 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 oh I'll tell you one other, one other tidbit. So I go in the green room, and there's somebody else sitting there. Just one other guy sitting there. I didn't recognize him. And he doesn't, he doesn't, even, he doesn't even notice that I'm in the room. So it gets kind of awkward, and I, I say, Hi there, I'm, I'm John Noe. said, Hi. I said, And you are? And he said, uh, Oh, what was his name? Uh, the guy that shot the lady on camera. What's his name? Shot the lady. Shot the lady on a, on a film stage. Film stage. Oh. What's his? Really? Yeah. The yeah. Alex Baldwin. Alex Baldwin. Oh. It was Alex Baldwin. And I said, "Oh, and what do you do?" <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't know him. I didn't know him. He said, oh, I'm an actor. I said, oh, really? Anything I, anything I know? I said, well, I've been on, Bush, uh, on the New York stage and, and, you know, in movies and things like that. And I said, really? Anything I might have seen? <laughs> and he said, well, yeah, did you see The Hunt for Red October? And I had seen it. And I said, yes. <laughs> and, and what did you do in it? <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, I'm just trying to carry on the conversation because I was having to force everything with him, you know, to get him to, to interact. And you know how awkward that can be. And he told me what he'd done. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah so forth like that. Well, he, 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 it wasn't too gracious of an interaction between the two of us. Anyway, so they finally called me. So Alex got to go on first. And Larry did the first half hour segment with him. And it was our turn. And he brings us in from the side. And we both come in. And I get to meet Harold for the first time. And I think we shook hands or did something cordial. And, uh, and, then, and then it started. And Harold, uh, and I'm going to say this as nicely as I can, was obnoxious. And he just talked and talked and talked and yelled and screamed and talked about how the world was going to end in 1994 and this was all going to happen and, you know, the Bible says it. Every, it's in here, everywhere, in there. Everybody knows that's going to happen. If this is just a sign that it's going to happen. And Larry let him go on and on and on and I'm sitting over there waiting for my turn. And, 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 and again, this was before interrupting people was popular. <laughs> So, so I just wait for Larry to, you know, and so finally Larry gets around and, you know, lets me talk. And, and that's pretty much the way the thing went. But I got to make my points, world without end, you know, that's what the Bible said, you know, stuff like that. And, but uh, if you did a content survey of that 30-minute show, I would say that between uh, uh, myself and Harold, he probably got 60 to 70 percent of the time. And I got the rest. And when I got home, and uh, my parents stayed with the kids, and I, and I came in after you know flying back, and my parents said, "Why didn't you get in there and talk and interrupt and get you let you let uh, uh, you know you let them walk all over you? You you didn't get in there and preach up and everything." And I said, "Well, you know, I made my points, and that." episode, which went out all over the place, opened up all sorts of doors for me. And, uh, and one of them was with uh, Dr. Massey, James Earl Massey, at that time Dean of the School of Theology of Anderson University. Again, this was before I did my seminar there, because uh, this, this predates all that. And, uh, and he said, I really enjoyed seeing, seeing how you performed or, or your interview and so forth on, on Harold Camping Show. And, uh, and I'd like to meet you. And I understand you live here in the Indiana area. I said, yes, sir, I do. And so he invited me up for lunch. And I went up and had lunch. And I was talking to him. And I was working on the book Beyond the End Times at that time. It's a precursor to uh, my book, uh, Here's The Perfect Ending he, for the he World. He started off with this one. These three. Well, that's another story. <laughs> this is another story. I'm not, not going to let him tell you that story because it's, it's too much time. He started off with this book. Then these three he did in conjunction with a, a, a organization called El International Preterist Association. Uh, another man who John and I know, and John worked with this man to to write these books, and they had somewhat of a falling out. After that, he writes this book, at which point he's now getting his PhD, which led to when he went to Anderson. Then he wrote this book, and after that came 19 more of his Hell Yes, and now he's finished his Greater Jesus, and now he's got three more books in the, in the hopper. Okay, So what I want you to see is the development of his eschatology. I've given you uh, five weeks. He's got 40 years. Many books, a lot of research. So, John, you've been in some debates, have you? <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Yes, uh, a number of debates with, uh, see if I can remember who all they were now. Uh, one of them with Church of God. Am I familiar with the Church of God? Know about them? If you weren't raised and baptized in their church, you're not a Christian. Oh. And I and they're our millennial. And you've already covered what all yeah. that means. Yeah. Right? And 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 I was and they brought me on to refute the preterist view. Well, they found they found out that they're going to find that hard hard to do because I'm not a pure preterist. 
I'm a preterist plus, which we'll get into yeah, yeah. A, a little, little while later, which, which has honked off all my preterist associates and uh, made me a persona non grata in their uh, meetings and, uh, co and congregations today. Uh, but what was I going to tell you? What was I, what was I going to tell you? I'm going to ask you another question. Okay, go ask me another question. So oh, oh, debates. <clears throat> oh, so, so, I'm, so I'm in here debating this guy, and he's just going <laughs> off on me like, like crazy. And, and he was advocating for, you know, the second coming of Jesus, and there's only two, only two comings of Jesus. One has happened and one hasn't. And I'm coming on saying, no, no. They're, the comings of Jesus run like a thread throughout the entire Bible. You want me to do, start documenting them for you? You know, both the Old Testament and the New Testament and the promises of his comings are multifold. Some you don't want to have happen to you. And he got up and he says, I think you all should know that John is not a Christian. Oh my goodness. <laughs> he actually said that? Oh my goodness. Oh, wow. And I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there waiting. No, because you know, you, 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 you trade times when you do a debate, formal debate. You know, he get his turn and I get my turn. And so I'm sitting there thinking, okay, what am I going to do with this? And I decided to do nothing. Good, good. Nothing. Not even recognize it or address it or whatsoever. And uh, that proved to be the best, best move I've ever made in a, in a formal debate. Now, there's been other debates where I wasn't so good. Uh, oh, I can't remember the guy's name. A dispensationalist, for example. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, didn't, I didn't, didn't do as well on that one. So, and, and many other informal ones, you know, like in the hallways and, and stuff like that. But uh, that's probably enough for that, isn't it? Okay. So, John, you are not a partial preterist, and okay. you are not a full preterist. But you're preteristic, but you're not partial and you're not full. Would you explain this thing about fulfilled, ongoing, and relevant? Could you clarify that to this group? And speak up a little bit. You're a little All softer. Right. All right, sorry. Ba based on my Ph.D. dissertation, what I advocated there is that eschatology is past in fulfillment, ongoing in relevance, as simplistic as you can get it. And I can prove it, biblically, and I have, to three dispensational professors who all disagreed with me. But, but if you look at this, Do you know what this means? You seem to know something about. It. You know what that means? They're all dispensationalists, but they accepted your PhD. They signed off on it. Did, did you influence? Do you think at the end at all? Did you, did you help them to change their views at all, Dr. Jones? No. They couldn't. So, is it, so is it, they couldn't because if they did, they couldn't teach uh, at where they teach and where they earn their livelihood. Time out. Time out, John. Did you hear what he said? Yes. When he wrote his dissertation, he had three dispensationalists on the committee, and they didn't want him to write the paper. But finally, he got them to, to sign it. They all signed off on it. Why? Because if they would have supported him, they would have lost their jobs because they couldn't even discuss alternative eschatologies it was not discussable. Do you understand why what we're doing here is so important? You can't talk about this stuff in the church. No way. Your pastors won't talk about it. You can't even bring it up. All they'll say is, you'll just confuse people. Well, have you looked around lately in your, in your pews? <laughs> you know how confused Christians are? You know how immobile they are? Do you know how tamed they are? Do you know how much of the culture we have lost in our lifespan compared to what we were given by our forefathers and our ancestors in the faith in this country? Most pastors don't have enough knowledge to debate you. No. Most pastors but don't they have got enough knowledge to, to avoid me. And they're scared yeah. to pay you because they don't yes. have enough yeah. now. Yeah. Yes. They can't so discuss it. Views, yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. 
But I think really the problem in education is they're telling them what to think and not how to think. Yes. How to yes. critically think. And, you know, if people say trust the science. Well, science is not to be trusted. Science is to be proven over and over again. You, have, you know, you have to, can you duplicate those mm. results? So people think, oh, well, we have one study that says this. Well, that's it. It's good. Trust the science. Instead of teaching people how to think and critically think about evidence and then analyze that evidence and synthesize it to. Brothers and sisters, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but our faith and the way we practice it is so far diluted, devalued, and diminished from how great it truly is. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Right. You know, just with what you said, and, I, and I've been exposed to that kind of stuff as well, I can disagree with Rick, I may or may not disagree with you, Brian, Dan, whoever, but it, it's, it's the height of idiocy and a lack of scriptural understanding to not not have the debate about the different views. We're literally commanded to by Paul. Let us sit and reason together. And for and it just I'm, it just really I, I really have issue with that when people are so afraid of a conversation about what it is that we believe in. That just it, it's just hard for me to. I mean I understand it, but it's hard for me to grasp. <laughs> it's called Nichols. <laughs> and know, know what the other word is? Begins with an N. In church growth circles, uh, nickels and noses. Nickels and noses. And noses. Yeah. So let's oh, move on, John. Lynn. So this right. slide here is with you and Dr. Lynn, Ni Lynn Hiles, and you're discussing the 70 weeks from Daniel, I believe. Uh, and the uh, uh, Daniel chapter 12, and, the, and 12. 1260 days, is it? Could 12, you like explain to them your relationship with Dr. Hiles and, and how this came about? How did he contact you? What happened there? Uh, well, Dr. Hiles was leaning this way, and uh, he became acquainted with me, and we visited him out in his uh, churches out in West Virginia, in the hills of West Virginia, beautiful country out there, and uh, uh, got acquainted, and... Uh, and then my book came out with the timeline on it, the timeline factor, which you'll see that in a minute when we get to it as part of this thing here that we'll do. Where I actually, and this is part of my dissertation again, uh, where I actually laid out the literal sequential chronological timeline of how every, every, everything prophesied regarding the end times. How it was prophesied, the time frame that were given, and how they were exactly, literally, and sequentially fulfilled. No other faith has this authenticating factor of validity. And we have ignored it, denied it, to our detriment. That's one reason, as I stated in my doctoral dissertation. And they signed off on? That's one reason that Christianity is far superior to any other faith or religion. Nobody has this. So we do. Yeah. And we ignore it and we deny it to our detriment and we're paying a huge price for sabotaging. And I'm not using that word lightly. We're sabotaging our own faith. Do you see the difference between theology and church? You see the difference? What he sees, obviously 40, 50 years of doing this, right? Over the course of that time, he didn't come to this conclusion sitting in a pre pew. <laughs> no way. Can't get it. So you wrote this book, back here, John, this Unraveling the End, which is about eschatology. And he unravels the whole confusion, pre-mail, post-mail, on-mail, rapture, tribulation, uh, uh, fulfilled, unfulfilled. He un unravels this end, a balanced scholarly synthesis of four competing, conflicting end-time views. He unravels it objectively, not subjectively, not advocating. His book doesn't advocate. It just says it's an objective view. But ultimately, he's done with this. 
I, I, I've talked to John enough to know. He's kind of done with eschatology. He's, he's had enough of it, right? And so he's moved on. And he, one of his more recent books is this, which talks about the, the application of eschatology, Brian. Hallelujah. Okay. And this book I have found, Dan, did you bring it by the chance? This book I have found, I think is one of his best. Because it, I, I well, read this. That's because you like my hero. I got, I, I got this. <laughs> but this one made application. He, he writes uh, scholarly, but he writes with understanding. All right. Dr. Knorr, are, are these your latest two? Uh, latest two books? No. No. Oh, they're not. My latest two is... My latest one is uh, 8070 the movie, which is the movie I was engaged with Hollywood writing for 12 years. And we had it, Mel, Mel Gibson was going to do it about the destruction of Jerusalem, 8070. Hmm. And, uh, and then he fell into hard times and didn't do it. Doctor, do you have, uh, of your books, do you have one that you consider to be your, your favorite or your best? Thank you. Yeah, my next one. Okay. Ah. <laughs> a good answer. It always is. It always is because you get tired of your other ones, you know. Yeah. By the time by the time you get into this stage, you're 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 ready to get rid of it, you know. Yeah. It, well, go ahead. What were you going to say? Uh, public? Do you have a public publication date of your next book? No. <laughs> no, you never know. That's a that's a, that's a crapshoot. <laughs> Go ahead. But, oh, I thought you were saying, saying about this. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I found this book. So I would like to shift a gear. Dan, have you read, have you, you I gave you the book last week. You said you were going to eat it. Did yes. you eat it? Did you get into it? Yeah. Comments. What, okay. what do you think? Uh, I mean, it, it's very biblical. It, uh, it dis he describes what, uh, I believe what Paul says in, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 16, we no longer know Jesus in the flesh. Now we know him in the spirit. And uh, and it's the calling of 1 Corinthians 1, 9, that the Father calls us into fellowship with the Son, but not the Son of the Gospels, the glorified version of Christ. I wrote a song yeah. back in the days when I was playing the guitar and doing this. I wrote about 50 or 60 songs. But anyway, not anymore. I, I fret not. <laughs> well, for those of you that don't understand that, you know, fingers don't fret good anymore. You know what I mean by that, don't you? But I wrote a song, and since it's that time of year, I thought I'd just share it with you since you brought it up. It's called, But He's Not Like That Anymore. Should I try to sing this? I, I, say, say it. I, we want, I, I want them to hear it. I'm a, I'm a big leaguer when it comes to singing. I bat about 300. <laughs> Some of you understood that. Okay. It's Christmas morning, everyone. Time for joy and time for fun. With mom and dad and family, we gather around the Christmas tree. But remember Jesus, he was born. Long ago, one Christmas morn, he lived a blessed life on earth. That's why we celebrate Jesus. Oh, you got it. But he's not like that anymore. No, he's not like that anymore. He's glorified in the highest. He's not like that. Sing with me. And he's not like that. No, he's not like that anymore. The babe, the son of Mary, the boy who played in Galilee, the man they hung at Calvary, the lamb who died for you and me. But he's not like that anymore. No, he's not like that anymore. He's the bride in the highest. No, he's not like that. No, he's not like that. No, he's not like that anymore. Where do you think that song's being played? 
Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, I think you should pass out. Or we should pass out the sheets now. I think you're all ready to go. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. This is this is a uh, the recap sheet from the uh, thirteen week seminar series that we did that I handed out to all the people and so forth and. Uh, Let's see, I'll refresh my memory here. Uh, so what Rick and I thought we'd do was we just go through this, use this as a sheet. It's an overall sheet. It's not, you know, the field of eschatology has got all this, what about this, what about that, what about this, what about that, you know, kind of stuff. We're not, we're not, we can't get into that kind of minutia today, but we want to give you a, a major overview here. Again, if you want to know more, get the book. <laughs> That's what the book's all about. Also, our Greater Than We Believe video series, some of you may be familiar with that on, on YouTube. Greater Than We Believe, we have a number of, of these, these and all these other things, you know, on there where my... Co-host Stephen King and I, uh, you know, discuss this stuff, and uh, also recommend that to your attention as well. So let's just start unraveling the end of biblical synthesis of competing views, uh, unifying one of the most divisive elements in recent Christian history. By the way, I got that from Christianity Today magazine in 1987. This is their 1987 edition, and in that they did a, and we were supposed to meet with them this yeah. week, weren't we, to talk about this. They did a major article with uh, four or five theologians here presenting their different eschatological views called Our Future Hope, Eschatology, and the Role in the Church. And the first line of that, this, this uh, uh, has a picture of Israel here, you know, it's always big in eschatology. It says, few doctrines unite and separate Christians as much as eschatology. Uh, it says it's one of the most divisive elements in recent Christian history. How recent do you think it, it was before it became one of the most divisive elements? Here, here's, a, here, here's a key for you. When Israel became a nation. 1948. That put the stamp of authentication on the dispensational view as the one and only right view according to the dispensationalists. And non-dispensationalists did not have a good response. They had really no response. They just tucked their neck, tucked their tails yeah, between their legs. Between their legs and you know wandered off. Well that's what got all this started here. One of the most divisive elements in recent Christian history. Uh, Dr. Massey who took me under his wings after the Larry King live show and helped me uh, write my, my book, uh, Beyond the End Times. Beyond the End Times. Uh, we took two years and personally tutored me through this. At the time, I had no theological education whatsoever. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and he's, he, as the quotes there, Noe's book just could be the spark that ignites the next reformation of Christianity. Uh, you were going to ask me, what, what, what can we do about all this? Yeah. If we need another reformation. I mean, it's that significant. Luther did not go far enough. Neither did Calvin or any of the other guys. They didn't go far. Enough. Now, they, what they did was good and all that stuff, but it wasn't sufficient. We need another great reformation. And that's what one of my next books is all about. Uh, we're tentatively looking at titles for it now. Okay, John, get to, um, uh, get to uh, I think, page 7 where you start talking about the solution, the synthesis, right? Okay. Because Patty's not going to be happy if you don't get there. All right. All On right. page seven, he talks about toward a solution of synthesis. So you don't have to, have to badmouth all the other uh, eschatologies, dispensationalism, for example. You don't have to do that. And so John has a way of synthesizing all of this, which I think is very peacemaking. 
It doesn't cause wars. There's no need to shoot each other over an eschatological view because there's a way to synthesize this. Could you expound on that? Here we go. Way? Page 7. The field of eschatology is a complex maze of confusing and conflicting views in which no consensus has ever existed in church history. This lack of consensus has led to major disarray and division in the church. Premillennialists say the amillennialists are wrong. The amillennialists say the premillennialists are wrong. The postmillennialists say they're right and everybody else is wrong. And few scholars are familiar with and even fewer lay people are aware that there is another comprehensive view called the Preterist view. The purpose of this 13-week series was to present, study, and analyze the four major eschatological views of the historic, evangelical, and conservative church to determine their principal strengths and weaknesses. As we will see, this field of theology has been plagued by the traditions of men. Does anybody know what the Bible says about the traditions of men? Make the word of God of little or no effect. And the field of eschatology is a classic example. Of, of, I, I, in my new book, I identify 30 of them. In fact, I'm thinking about calling it for 30 traditions, for 30 pieces of tradition. tradition. Does that sound familiar? To what? 30 pieces of silver. Both are betrayals of our once almighty faith. Yeah, that's a pretty good subtitle, don't you think? Keep going, keep going. All right. All right. This, okay, where was I here? As we shall see, this field of theology has been plagued by traditions of men and unscriptural false paradigms. Paradigms are important. Your view of the future determines your philosophy of life. And I can elaborate on that, but I won't because you're trying to get me, get me moving along. So, okay. Uh, uh, th these have forced their proponents to override sound hermeneutical and exegetical principles to interpret Scripture. Now, your group here knows what those words mean, right? They know. They okay. Know. Consequently, three major dichotomizing hermeneutics. You know what dichotomizing means? Yeah. This goes there. This goes over here. This has happened. This hadn't happened. Dividing. Uh, has plagued uh, Christianity throughout its history. Fourfold premise. This... Solution of Synthesis is based upon the presenter's completed Ph.D. dissertation, which was subtitled An Evaluation and Synthesis of the Four Major uh, Evangelical Views of the Return of Christ. My premise was simple, straightforward, and fourfold. Number one, God is not the author of our confusion in eschatology. Cites there. We are. I assume that it was not and is not God's character or nature to have included in his word any content that would create the amount of confusion, conflict, and divisiveness or, and or ambivalence we see among Christians in this area of eschatology. Personal interpretations have muddied the waters for everyone. I further assume that we are the ones who have misconstrued the whole thing and that this impasse could be resolved scripturally. What does the Bible say? and not say properly translated. There are translation problems that are significant in this area. Two, each of the four views centers on the return of Christ as a central, pivotal, and controlling end-time event. So get this one right, and the other events will readily fall into place. Third premise, each view has principal strengths and weaknesses that can be identified through a scripturally disciplined approach grounded upon what the text actually says and does not say. Again, properly translated. Eschatology is an area filled with problems caused by both additions and subtractions to the text. Uh, what was on? Three? No, excuse me. And, and these, these are necessitated by the traditions of men that will not stand up to an honest and sincere and objective test of Scripture. Yet more often than not, we are unaware of the weaknesses inherent in our own view until someone points us out, points them out to us, and then we kill the messenger. They are blind spots, and unlearning is the hardest form of learning. Anybody ever hear that before? Unlearning is the hardest form of learning. I don't know. I don't have any idea. I've never heard that. I also knew that I'd have to 
uh, be both objective and gracious in exposing these weaknesses for each view. And I semi-succeeded. Four, the solution would be a solution of synthesis, discarding the weaknesses and keeping the strengths and synthesizing the strengths into one meaningful, coherent, and consistent view that is more Christ-honoring, scriptural, scripture authenticating and faith validating than any one view in and of itself. Since each view has grasped a portion of the biblical truth regarding the end times, I proposed a solution, a, a synthesis treatment uh, that would meet all hermeneutical and exegetical demands and not contradict itself. This was significant because no one had ever done this before in church history, and I had to prove that in order to get that proposal even accepted, let alone the whole thing approved, which is, two, which is a two-step process. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, all right. Recap, okay. So now here's a recap. Now I know you can have all sorts of, well, what about this, what about that? But, but just hold that in advance. Let's just get through, get through this. So we're going to look at the, at the different views. Uh, and their principal uh, recap of their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, the preterist view. Preterist is, it, uh, comes from the Latin word praetor, meaning praetor, meaning past and fulfillment, and that's what that means. So I, I just think real quick because th see the, these are the different different categories than what we did with Rick recently. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we have to kind of. So John and I talked about this. What I presented to you was futurist, yeah. idealist. Historis and preteristic. John, in this part, he includes, he puts the amill, the pre mill, post mill, he takes the futuristic concepts as one of the overriding uh, views, right? Whereas I took the pre mill, post mill, amill, rapture, tribulation, and I said, those all fall underneath a dispensational view. Really, preterist. And uh, uh, idealist historicists, they don't really get hung up on all the millennial tribulation rapture stuff. They do, but not to the extent of the dispensational view. So John, as, as he did his, and I told you this the first time I presented this, that I, I just presented my, my points differently. You, you guys get that now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So his views don't really line, the way he presented it, don't quite line up with the way I, that I presented it. Okay. All right. Now, the way Christianity Today did it lines up with what I did. So I'm not out in left field totally you know, on that, just because I don't agree with Rich on how he categorizes them. But you can categorize them differently. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the preterist view is a past view. The, the dispensational premillennial view is a future view. The amillennial is a future view. And the postmillennial is a future view. Yeah. So I just happen to break it down more, so to speak. Okay, number one strength, the Preterist view fully accepts the natural reading and understanding of eschatological time frames and the New Testament and, and, and New Testament time and imminency statements, including those bracketing the entire prophecy of Revelation. Supports two supports the first century Holy Spirit guided expectations as the correct ones. Anybody know what the first century expectations were for these things to be fulfilled? In their lifetime. Yes. Where do you think they got that from? Jesus. And? And Paul. And? All the... One, one more person. Peter. Peter. John. How about the Holy Spirit? Uh, <laughs> oh, that guy. Oh, that guy. Oh, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> so so if, they, if they were misguided, <clears throat> how can we trust them? To convey other aspects of the faith. Maybe we missed some other aspects of the faith. Keep going, John. Keep going. Okay. Balance, uh, balance, balances literal and figurative language for the nature of fulfillment. Uses biblical precedents to explain the nature of fulfillment. Harmonizes time conver convergence of OT, Old Testament, time prophecies with New Testament, time statements, and Holy Spirit-led expectations. There that is again. Uh, six, uh, recognizes the es eschatology is connected to Israel and pertains to the end of the Jewish age. What was that, people? What was that? What ended? Don't, don't let me down now. The temple. Tell John what ended 
What ended? And when did it end? Now, Jesus said the new, the new could not fully come until the old was fully removed. The wine skins, right? Uh, the stones. The stones. The temple. And the field plowed over in fulfillment of Micah. I believe it's Micah's prophecy. Okay. Uh, affirms that God always, uh, where was I on? Affirms that God has always had only one continuous by faith people. Posits a positive worldview and long term outlook. Acknowledges that God's material creation is without end. Uh, answers the liberal skeptic attack on the Bible and on Christ, which effectively says that Jesus was wrong. Mistaken. And so forth. Weaknesses. Posits AD 70 as the time of Christ's second coming and return. Brothers and sisters, do you know that that language is never used in the Bible? You know why? It's inappropriate. It's totally inappropriate. That's a, that's a doctrine of men. A tradition of men. That's a biggie, by the way. Uh... A finality paradigm which limits the comings of Jesus to only two. Three. Thus, AD 70 was Jesus' final coming, according to the Preterist view. No way. See, that's a problem for Preterists, right? Jesus came back in David. So that's it. He's not. That's it. It's over. A Preterist who holds that, he's got a problem. And so... John and I were talking about we don't necessarily like to be in the preterist camp because that view is held that it happened and it's over. That's it. But John doesn't view it that way. That's why he 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 has his pips. Okay, and we're going to get that too. Keep and, and in the book, you'll see where I document many comings of Jesus in the Old Testament time. Some of them were visible, physical. Others were not in the same. And dittos, by the way, in the New Testament. And the promises of his comings are multifold, some visible, some not. Some you, do, you don't want to have happen to you. If you want some examples, read Revelation chapters 2 and 3, for example. Okay, where were we here? Uh, That's 8070. Orally spiritualizes Christ's return, resurrection, and his kingdom. Enormous exegetical and historical burden for documenting fulfillment. Lack of attention in writings to the nature of post-8070 reality and implications for Christian living. Gross cessationism. Many preterists advocate the annihilation of Satan and his kingdom and or cessation of the operation of angels, the ministry of Holy Spirit, and the miraculous gifts of the Spirit in post-8070. Okay. Uh, the dispensational view. Dispensational premillennial view, which is the popular view the dominant view in conservative evangelical circles worldwide. Sad to say. Strong interest in end-time prophecy. Well, that's an understatement. <laughs> Have you turned on TV lately? <laughs> uh, emphasis, emphasis on the dramatic role of Christ in the present and future affairs of humankind. Recognizes that eschatology is connected to Israel and pertains to the end of the Jewish age. Uh, realization that at least one coming of Christ is not visible. All right. Uh, weaknesses. Posits the time of Christ's second coming and return as being very soon today. Interpreting divine time frames without clear textual justification. Arbitrary use of gaps of time, where they insert gaps of undeterminable length, like in Daniel's 70 weeks and Daniel's time of the end time frame, and it's gone on for extended almost 2,000 years now, and they just extend it out in the future. And if you can stick something out in the future, you can never be proven wrong. And never be proven right either, but anyway. Okay, uh, where was I? Bifurcation passages. Uh, bifurcation passages of Scripture, including the book of Revelation. I get to do the same thing, stick a gap in there. You stick a gap one place, you got to stick it somewhere else. And if you stick it somewhere else, you got to stick it someplace else. And they got to do that throughout. 
And that's our methodology. Total fabrications. Interpreting, uh, interpreting by exception and specialized meaning, i.e. ignoring or changing the meaning of commonly used and normally understood words in the time statements, like what? Like shortly to take place. Now, approaching 2,000 years and counting, for example, in a little while. At hand, Jesus said the time of the end is at hand. Soon. Means, means it's a Greek word, engus, which means graspable, seizable, there for the taking, not 2,000 years from now. He said, the one who betrays me is at hand. For example, you reached over and grabbed the guy. All right. Uh, where were, Postulating. Where, did I do relying on delay theory? No. Where was I? Postulating. Postponing the kingdom of God. Postponing the kingdom of God. Yeah, they have to do that. Uh, one of these days, Jesus is going to come back and set up his kingdom. Well, what did he do the first time? And whatever happened to that one? Whatever happened to that one? Because his kingdom is without end. To the increase of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Well, you can't have it withdrawn or canceled or put on hold, can you? To the increase of it, there shall be no end. The fact that we're sitting here 6,000 miles away from where that kingdom was born. So that's how the kingdom came. The kingdom was born into human existence, was it not? And from that time on, it's only been increasing. In fact, again, that we're sitting here 6,000 miles away from where that event took place is, is, is a, another illustration and verification of the increase of that kingdom. Okay. Where was I? Uh, postulating, uh, postulating delay theory. And three times in Scripture, there it states, there will be no delay. There will be no delay, no delay. And delay theory is one of the hallmarks of the dispensational view. And they stick it in several places. In Daniel's prophecies, uh, in Ezekiel's prophecies, in Revelation's prophecy. Stick it in all over the Keep place. Keep Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm talking too much. Right? Inventing, uh, advocating a seven-year period of tribulation, uh, inventing the rapture idea in the 1830s, uh, identifying Daniel's 70th week with Jesus's Olivet Discourse, advocating separate redemptive plans for Israel and the Church, uh, the, 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 the denigrating the church as an unforeseen and a parenthesis in God's plan of redemption, advocating a future restoration of the old and inferior Judaic order, uh, a dichotomized hermeneutic based on a false paradigm, i.e. a church Israel distinctive, incomplete salvation and, and resurrection reality. Well, it's kind of, sort of, somehow here. Uh, Positing a negative worldview and short-term outlook for our present time. Okay, a millennial view. Strengths, idealist interpretation of the book of Revelation. In the middle of the book of Revelation, John is told to eat the scroll, it, eat the scroll that the whole book came out of, that the angel handled him. You know why he was to eat the book? About? About many different nations, languages, tongues, and kings, which includes us. Includes America. Not just what was going to happen in Israel back in that time of the end. So that takes the whole prophecy of the book of Revelation and extrapolates it beyond its historical fulfillment. That why, that's why I call it a preterist, idealist. Wait, wait, wait. That's important, okay? He, he puts idealism in his view because it extends revelation. It extends the relevance. The relevance it goes out. It's ongoing, continuous ongoing. This Jesus is an active and involved Messiah. Well, idealism means it's happened in the past and will happen in the future, right? There's a, there's ongoing. A ongoing. 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 Ongoing, yes. Ongoing is a word I prefer. But it covers both of those things. Okay, ah, millennial. Uh, an idealist interpretation of the book of Revelation. We want to keep that. 
Uh, emphasis on the literal unseen realities behind symbolic fulfillment. Recognition that the last days existed in the first century. Uh, the present reality of the kingdom of Christ. Uh, rejection of the idea of a future kingdom. Uh, attempts to honor both literal and figurative language. Weaknesses. Positing the time of Christ's second coming and return as being unknowable. Not only is it unknowable, but it's also unbiblical terminology. Advocating ambiguity and uncertainty. Uh, all millennials, I like to refer to them as all millennial means, oh, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's good. And you, can, and you can't know. Nobody can know. Only God knows. You all feel blessed now. Uh, <laughs> insistence that the time of fulfillment cannot be known. Yes, it could. They were to know it. Because when they saw things, this stuff starting to happen, they were to get out of town. Were they not? They could know it. Why can't we go back and know it? Wow. Little interest in end time prophecy. That's sad, but true. Uh, relevance, uh, uh, reliance on delay theory again. Uh, adherence to an unscriptural end of time paradigm. What does the Bible have to say about an end of time? Nothing. It's time of the end. Big difference. Uh, use of dichotomizing hermeneutics based upon that paradigm, because they have to. They have to put something in that blank. You know, if you've got two different time frames, you've got to put something in that, that, the first one and something in the other one. So you, you get into bifurcating passages of Scripture, including the book of Revelation, advocating a final uh, return, final consummation. Uh, how many finals are there? Or how many returns are there? Uh, and the answer is none. Because Jesus said, as he promised, he would never leave you or forsake you. And that's a big subject. I'll do a whole chapter on that one. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, belief that the Jewish age, the Old Covenant order, and the law were completely fulfilled and removed and that all Old Testament prophecies and promises were fulfilled and accomplished and completed at the cross? No way. Resurrection hadn't even happened yet. For one, right? That's part of it, isn't it? I think it is. Uh, let's see. New Covenant. The New Covenant began and was fully enforced at Pentecost. The full establishment of the kingdom, the church, the New Covenant order was given and per perfected and fulfilled. The church was the church as a replacement of Israel. Uh, claim that uh, eschatology pertains to the end of the Christian age or to a split fulfillment in time and uh, disposition, i.e. the Jewish age, Christian age, with a gap of thousands of years in between. Everybody ever heard of that? Uh, advocating a current intermediate state of disembodied existence in heaven. Doesn't that sound like something to look forward to? Yeah. Yeah, you'll have to explain your, it's, it's your understanding of, of the intermediate state, if there is, the soul, that separation from the body, and all of that. There is not. So you, you believe in the monistic... Fulfilled and ongoing. So, are you saying then Revelation uh, or First Corinthians fifteen and First Thessalonians four? That's just symbolic. Then that's no. not an actual no. occurrence. I'm saying it's fulfilled and ongoing in reality. Frederick's idealist. The dead have been raised. Our bodies are corruptible, though. <clears throat> yeah, now they're yeah, corruptible. Yeah, because you're going to get a new one. When is that going to happen? When you die. Ah, so you believe then, and in, 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 in not in the soul from the body, you believe that that's... You, get you, have, a new, you have a you, monistic view then. First of, Corinthians 15 says that God gives us a new spiritual body. Yeah. But it, it implies a time frame when Jesus, yeah, the so-called yeah. rapture... Yeah, there was. There was. Oh, there was. So you're, you're saying past. At that time, yeah. That's preterist. Past in fulfillment. That's so, what preterist means. So when we die then... Physically, our body goes into the grave. Then uh -huh. what happens after that? You get a new spiritual body if you're a Christian. So, so that, you believe that goes to heaven then? Yeah, God can just speak it into existence. 
I mean, he doesn't need your old. So atoms. He doesn't need your old atoms and molecules, or if you got a, if you got an artificial hip like I do. I mean, that's not going to get raised up. I do. Do you have artificial? Well, uh, yeah, yeah. I had one eight weeks ago. Dave, too. Well, where are you at, Dave? You're <laughs> <laughs> a lot older than Dave, though. So. Yeah, I had a quite quite a conversation with my hip doctor about that whole issue. <laughs> okay, all right, we're getting off topic. All right, where was I here? Uh, equating the age to, and by the way. Whole chapters on this, on, on resurrection reality. Whole chapters. I mean, there's a lot here. And there's a lot of different views on this. I mean, lots. Uh, equating these to come as being heaven or yet future. Uh, a mixed po positive and negative worldview. Uh, and the last one here is the post-millennial view. By the way, the post-millennial view is a, is, a, is a great view. A great view. That's the view that our forefathers in the faith came to this country under to not just escape religious persecution, but to establish, to form, establish the great institutions of this country that we've been living under for at least a while until the last administration came in. Anyway, okay. Post millennial view. Strong kingdom society orientation, positive uh, emphasis and motivation for human effort to expand God's kingdom on earth. That's what they were doing. They came here to expand it. Formed all institutions in this country, and we've given them all away. Name one we haven't given away. And we didn't get pushed out by a superior force. We backed out and created a vacuum. And into that vacuum came the ungodly crowd, the secular humanists, took them over and began dismantling our moral society. And we let them do it. Why? Because we think Jesus is going to come back and get us out of here. I'm serious. Okay. Uh, where was I? Did I, did I do all the story? you... Did uh, I do all the strengths? No. Go to positive. Work. What was that? Positive. positive world. Po worldview. Positive. Positive worldview. worldview Long-term outlook. Recognition of many comings of Jesus. Many comings, and and many valid preterist understandings in the post-millennial camp. Weaknesses posing the time of Christ's second coming and return as being far, far away still yet today. Insistence, the world must be more Christianized to, to a significant degree before Christ can return. Adherence to an unscriptural end-of-time paradigm. Use of a dichotomizing hermeneutic based upon that paradigm. Claim that the eschatolog eschatology pertains to the end of the Christian age. It did not. It pertained to the end of the New Old Covenant Jewish age. Postulating two or more Perusia returns of Christ, uh, posing, uh, postulating a final coming and last judgment after which there will be no more, numerous partial preterist inconsistencies from failure to fully honor the time statements, bifurcating passages of Scripture, including the book of Revelation, reliance on delay theory, insistence that the time of fulfillment cannot be known, Incomplete salvation and resurrection reality, advocating a future evilist utopian and eternal state on earth, over dependency on creedal authority, and the age to come is yet future. Okay, let's go into a synthesis. How much time do we have? You keep going. Okay. Because um, Patty's not going to be happy if we don't get this part done. A synthesis of views. First and foremost, the central and pivotal and controlling end-time event contained in each of the four views was the so-called second coming or return of Christ. It is taken off of the table of synthesis. It is a weakness to be discarded for the following reasons. Number one, the words return and second coming are not properly speaking biblical words in that the two words do not represent any equivalent Greek words. These two non-scriptural expressions are also unscriptural concepts that will not stand up to an honest and sincere test of scripture. They are to be replaced 
by the many comings of Jesus and the biblical fact that he never left as he promised. Matthew 28, 20. Hence, these two traditional expressions and concepts are inappropriate, and that's why the Bible, properly translated, never uses them. Secondly, the superiority of time the... Out, time out. Any comments? What do you do with the book of John? Where Jesus says, he says, I will not leave you as orphans. So he has a left, and he tells Mary, don't cling to me, I have to leave the Father. <clears throat> That's why return language is never used. No, he never left us. So he never... Went to the Father, or yeah, but that's not leaving. No, not for him. Well, he's omnipresent, so he's can be more places than <laughs> exactly. Even in his glorified body. Uh, should, yeah, because he couldn't do that he when he was, was in his in. physical body. Then why didn't he say I had to leave so that the spirit could come? Because he had to go there and send the spirit back. So did he go? Yeah, but he didn't go. No. <laughs> <laughs> It's all the, all the above. Left. All the above. He never left. That's what omnipresence is all about. So the Jesus at the right hand of God, is this symbolic? No. It's, it's, it's literal. Is spirit literal? I think the question is manifest presence. Yeah, manifest. I'm talking manifest. So yeah. is he manifest present everywhere, even though he's yeah. only with two Whenever, people? Wherever he wants to be. He, well, yes. Okay. But yet, according to his word, he says we're two or three are... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah that, that would be part of that. Yeah. Versus incorruptible body, then. Brothers and sisters, <laughs> we need to broaden. Yeah, it's multidimensional. We need to broaden our understanding here of these things. If you try to understand it like this, you're going to get all messed up. And we, and we are messed up. You've already agreed that we're messed up. All right. Okay. All right, let's go on here. All right, I mean, second, I mean, secondly, right? Yeah. The yeah. superiority of the present, the, the preterist view over the other three views is simple and profound, but not sufficient in and of itself. That's got me kicked out of the preterist camp. Literally. Literally. Yeah, well, I'm. I'm you, you didn't express that you, you have an additional I, I'm starting acronym. To, yeah. I'm, I'm, starting, I'm, just asking. I'm starting to realize, obviously, I'm growing too, right? I, I have to change too because I'm, I'm learning. And so is John, right? We're, we're realizing, oh, oh, well, I, I, I had some stuff I believed, but I don't believe it anymore, right? But, and part of this, right, I don't like to be called a preterist because of what people think of the preterist, right? I, I bet, because I don't want to be categorized that way. So I have to find a way to convey my eschatology without offending a dispensationalist, because as soon as they hear preterists, they beat you up or they'll run away. But I, I want to find a way to dialogue and engage, right? Mm -hmm. And that John has pretty much fine-tuned that. He's able to do that. But he's been kicked out of the preterist camp. Because the preterists don't like that he can synthesize the views with the dispensationalists. They don't like that, so they kick him out. Am I okay there, John? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, this is not a popular view, as you can imagine. But if you, if we, you want to talk about Reformation, that's what it takes. You know, the, the, the Luther and his boys weren't popular either. You know what the church tried to do to them, right? So do you want to be part of this or not? Keep going. It is, it is the only view that fully accepts the, and honors the natural reading and understanding of Jesus' time-restricted words and intensifying imminency declarations of the New Testament writers. No other view can legitimately make this claim. It also documents how Jesus came on the clouds in age-ending judgment exactly as and when and exactly as and when every New Testament writer and the early church expected, as they were led into all truth and shown the things that were to come by the Holy Spirit. 
It emphasizes the harmony of the precise past fulfillment with the literal, exact, chronological, and sequential fulfillment of Daniel's two specific and two general time prophecies. No interruptive gaps, no exegetical devices. These prophecies uh, frame the end times and establish its historical setting and uh, and define and defining characteristic. If you look on the back, you see the layout of that of that time those tomb time prophecies there. Thus, everything happened quote just at the right time. End quote Romans five six and in its proper time. First Timothy two six. This amazing harmony and perfection of timely past fulfillment is God's stamp or fingerprint of divinity or divine perfection not only in Bible times, but also in the end times. Yet while superior, the preterist view was found to be insufficient in and of itself. Two of its major identified weaknesses are the preterist insistence that the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple was the final coming of Christ. Hold it. We've talked about that, it, that, that Jesus was there, the, the destruction of the temple, okay, the preterists will say, that's the final time he's coming. But no, he says, no. The preterists hate him for that. Because what he says is that, no, it's not the only coming. That's why his use of the words relevant and ongoing comes again and again is a unique eschatological view. It's just unique. And the preterists hate him for that. Is that pretty much right, John? Yeah. yeah. Uh, where was I? The final coming of Christ, prophecy of uh, the book of Revelation was, or they also advocate that the prophecy of the book of Revelation was exhausted in the events of eighty seventy. No, John's told to eat the, as I mentioned earlier, he's told to eat the eat, eat the word the, the scroll that that the, the, that angel was handled handed uh, to John on the Isle of Patmos, from which the whole prophecy comes out, and he interprets that to mean that eating of it and digesting of it, that he is to prophesy again about many different nations, languages, tongues, and kings. That gives you the exegetical basis for extrapolating, extrapolating the relevancy of the entire prophecy throughout time and, and places. Yeah. So when he says, when he says, when he reaches out like this, Revelation is, goes on. We, we look at the book of Revelation and, and we want to stop it. The preterists do, right? But John says, no, it, it just keeps going. It just keep, keeps on going. It's relevant and ongoing. Ongoing. I mean, our Lord is much more active and involved and all-powerful than we realize. Keep going. Okay. Uh, where was I? Uh, Therefore, the strengths of the other three views... Where was I? Where was I? Uh, just past number two. Therefore, the strengths of the other three views must also be incorporated into the strengths of the preterist view. Okay. Then take it from, right. from the amillennial. From the amillennial view was kept the idealist interpretation of the book of Revelation. That's, that's one of their biggest strengths, is the idealist. What I just shared with you, they agree with. Amillennial scholars totally agree with me on that. But that's what that means. That's what eating that scroll and, and regurgitate, they totally agree with me on that. And by the way, they agree with me on, on the many comings of Jesus, too. Now, they don't agree with me on some other things, but, but they do on those. Okay. Uh, ongoing historical... Blah, blah, blah. From a post-millennial view was incorporated, but reapplied its strong kingdom society orientation. They, the the post-millennialists make everybody else's views of the kingdom look, look pale in comparison. They, they, are the, they are the champs of that. Uh, uh, positive worldviews and so on and so forth. From the dispensational premillennial view was retained its strong interest in prophecy and the current dynamic role of Christ in the present and future affairs of humankind, although this must now be reapplied per this synthesis. This, oh, by the way, my, dispensa my, my, my three dispensational Professors hated that. And one of them said, don't ever associate my name <laughs> with that. With that. With that. <laughs> so, so would you blank that out? Well, you, you read his name. One of those names was like that. He said, don't ever associate my, my name with this thing. Uh, 
discarded were uh, the identified weaknesses from each of the four views that did not stand up to this series, honest and objective test of Scripture, not test of what John Noe wants or what my professors want, but what will stand up to the test of Scripture, pure and simple. And that's it. In sum, uh, this series has presented a new groundwork or breakthrough initiative for eschatological reform, consensus, and unity. Others can now build on these findings as we more readily come together to build a fuller and deeper understanding of our once for all delivered faith. When was that faith once for all delivered? If you'll turn to the back page, you'll see the timeline right there. That's when it all happened. And from there on, it's just been growing and growing and expanding and expanding. And again, the fact that we're sitting here 6,000 miles away from where all this happened is evidence of that increase. that do it? Jason, what do you have to say, young man? <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this is a lot of good review for me because I've been following John for several years uh, with further explanation. And, and again, I think I said it last time, it is awesome, and you started with this too, it's awesome to be able to be here and be part of this. I wish I could be every week because where I come from, it's a wilderness up there. Uh, to have something like this to be able to come to is, I, there's not many places in the world like this, I don't think. Uh, so it's just a blessing to be here. Mm -hmm. Any comments? What do you guys got to say? Wait, wait. Noah has just presented his synthesis. He doesn't throw out dispensationalism. <clears throat> he says there's good points there, particularly for prophecy, and the other views as well. I, I appreciate, John, just your, your willingness for peace and, and unity within the body and, and you know, trying to bring people together, open their minds, op open their critical thinking, and challenging them to, to faith and exegesis and interpretation and doing it, I, I believe, in a, in a way of humility and love. I mean, that's what the church is missing too because it, it, it's so splintered. We divide over silly, silly issues. It's just absolutely pathetic it's what we divide over. You know, and, and something as complex as this, complex in a lot of ways, and, and, and they have the audacity that when I, you know, that I'm a futurist, and that's all the view I have because what I was taught or the little study I've done, and disregard great theologians like yourself, is the, is a height of stupidity and pride. To yes. actually go against conservative theological, uh, evangelical uh, theologians, they yep. have the audacity. Yep. Yep. To go against 40 years of scholarship, that well, I, I'm convinced of futurism. It's, it's a high, it's a heist of stupidity and, and pride. It's 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 very rampant, and that's rampant in the church. Or you know, like you said, in the money and the growth of the church, and having your own your own uh, you know denominational slant that you have to maintain. You know, um, is silly. It's really silly. Now, now, just let me augment that a little bit. I'm, I'm not, not against, against futurism. futurism. No, I know. That's okay. It. Okay. okay. No, that, that, that's uh, the okay. point. Yeah, yes, because you're bringing these together. You're yes. Sense of, yeah, absolutely. So you're not dis disregarding the dis dispensationalists and the ones that are steeped in that. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're trying to bring people together. And that's very evident. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate, Appreciate that. that. Anybody? I just like how it just expands the sovereignty and just just makes God all all, all more bigger and Jesus too. You know, it's the, the greater Jesus. It's to me, it's it, it, if any. I think I've said this before too. Like when I'm discerning my view, if if it's attacking the sovereignty of God and it's mm. trying to diminish it, then that's a problem. Yeah. Mm. That's a good one. You know, and if it's advocating the sovereignty of God and, and expanding it, and our well, ironically, that's what these four views are all doing. They're, they're diminishing. diminishing. Yeah, yeah. And then you're 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 yeah. so to speak, cherry picking the best parts of each one, the strengths, and combining those together. Mm -hmm. And and when when you try to put God in a box on one little view, boy, you better be careful with that. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah you, you might, might have, have an answer for that. Yeah, right? right? Well, it's, it's, according to Dr. Massey, as you see there, his quote, he, he, he felt back, back then, and uh, he's uh, since gone on to be with the Lord, uh, that this could be the spark that ignites the next reformation of Christianity. I mean, I probably will not see it happen. So my desire is to get it planted as well as I can before I leave planet Earth. And maybe some of you in here will be part of that plant. If you were awesome. going to lead the next Reformation, what would be three major points that right off the bat would have to be nailed on the door? Mm -hmm. you, you only, only give, give me three? three? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to yeah, take yeah, up too much. Why, why give you a time. Time. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, That's a good question. Uh, well, well, how about Jude 3? three? That's, That's three, three, isn't it? Jude, Jude 3, how about Jude 3? Earnestly, Earnestly contend for the faith that was. Notice the past tense. Once, once for all delivered to the saints. How about just, we start there. We don't do that. In fact, we deny it. <coughs> We're still waiting on Jesus to come back and do this and that. It's well, been entrusted to us. We have it. But we've, we've let it go. We have it. Well, we had it. And we let it go. And John's saying... We got to get it back again. Is that am I okay with that, John? Well, I don't know that we ever really had it. Uh, we were closer with the with the post millennial view. The po yes, yeah. because their view of the kingdom was just fabulous. Yeah, uh, they just had the wrong eschatology, but uh, they weren't they weren't encumbered by it. Yeah, and so they were able to straddle those. But when the dispensational view came along, it just took the planks right out from under them. So the post millennials. Were the were the What's nation's the fathers? That they, that that was all the that was all the faith based people who came from England and Holland and and they all came over here. They we're all post millennial, and they had a a beautiful view of the future. And so they established the nation, the United States, with this wow hope. But then dispensationalism stopped in, and our our view for the future has become horrible. We're waiting for Jesus to come back and blow everything up in a, in a, with a nuclear bomb. And the post millennials never, never thought of that. They were always, let's go. We can conquer anything. We can do it. We can do it. But that view has been replaced. And, and it's a problem. It's a problem. It's but, a problem. But people don't want to address it. They want, nobody wants to talk about it. They're afraid of it. You can't discuss it. J. Barton Payne. In, in this Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy, the complete guide to scriptural predictions and their fulfillment, writes this in his, uh, in, in his preface. He says this, But there still remains an urgent need within Christian literature for a synthesis of God's precious and magnificent promises. But perhaps simply because of the vast bulk of relational matter that is involved, no truly comprehensive study has as yet, and this is 1973 vintage, as of yet been undertaken as a representative of the, uh, uh, oh, and he says this, as a representative of the former type of book, J. Dwight Pentecost, uh, his book, Things to Come, states of, of its own, by no means in, by no means, means in considerable context, quote, there has been little attempt to synthesize the whole field of prophecy, and there is a great need for a synthetic study and presentation of biblical prophecy. That was the statement that proved to my doctoral committee 
that this proposal and consequential doctrinal work would be a contribution to knowledge and had never been done before in church history. Now doing it and employing it, two different things. And, and I seek your involvement. So, Seek your involvement. So, so, so the church has failed miserably in the post-millennial aspect that we're reigning with Christ in the millennial kingdom, and because of what's because of of the church, us not pursuing the things of Jesus and not being proactive in our faith, in culture, in whatever you said the void earlier. So, you know, we have this idea what you know. Yeah, Jesus coming back and, and rectifying all of that. That's obviously the misplaced view. Let him, let him so, take so, care. So the, church, so the church had all power because of Jesus being the head, and we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't understand that, or we didn't understand the power in, in, our, in our role, in our commitment. We let it all go to hell, essentially. Would you agree? Yes. Okay, okay I agree with you. Okay. I was wondering if you had a, you know... If that's a fair statement. Those who believe in me. How many in this room believe in Jesus? These are Jesus' words. Okay, let the record show that everybody raise their hands. <laughs> Those who believe in me. You ready for this? The works that I do yeah. Yeah. shall you do. Now, there's more. But do you know what kind of works Jesus was doing? A lot of. And greater works than these shall you do. Amen. Where is that being preached? And taught? And put in doctrinal statements? Where? You think that would make a difference on Sunday mornings? Amen. Not to mention Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Fridays? <laughs> it's even Saturdays? <clears throat> During football season? And I like football, unless you're from Indiana. Mm -hmm. You got the Colts. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Not Indiana University. <laughs> well, that too. But, but anyway, uh, it, it, is a, it is a great challenge. I, I, I hope I see some fruit from this before I pass on. Uh, but I might not. And I got to be willing to. To, you know, uh, John and I were obviously he got here this afternoon, so we had some time, and Donna had a dentist appointment, so John and I got a lot of good good conversation, good talk together, and we were hoping he and I were hoping to get a meeting with Christianity Today. The president's name is Tim Daly Ripple. I've spoken with him. John has met him. Uh, he is aware of us. Uh, we wanted to get a meeting with him either today or tomorrow. Unfortunately, his secretary was kind of like a fence. We couldn't, we couldn't get in, which kind of took a little bit of the sales, wind out of our sales. I was hoping, and I think John was too, but we got an email from Catherine or Christine, Christine, the secretary, and it was somewhat uplifting to John and I that we will get a meeting. And what we want to say to Tim Daly Ripple, we want to say this, Tim, you want to run a magazine for Christianity today and end your career like that? That's fine. But how about you open up this, this realm of eschatology and really make a difference for the kingdom of God? Running a magazine, no big deal. But if you could affect the, 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 the masses that you have the ability to do, why don't you jump on a bandwagon with us and let, it, let us help you do that? So John and I were hoping for, to, to get that meeting. It didn't happen. And so when John says, how much time do we have left? Well, we're older, right? So who's going to pick up this, this, this mantle? Who's going to do that? What well, young guys are going to pick it up? Well, the young guys coming out of school, they're all waiting for Jesus to come back, right? And who's going to pick this up and run? And so John and I were, were like somewhat, eh, a little bit uh, melancholy that our age is now 
our age is now a factor and how much more can we do? How many books does John have in him? Three? He's, you got three, right. You're working on three, right? Okay. And so we realize our time is, our time is limited, right? Do you see what we're talking about here? Do you see the, the, do you see the basis of, of Christianity? And everybody's running around, uh, I don't know, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know what the Christianity is doing today. Everybody's going to church. As long as they go to church Sunday morning, three pairs, a song, a sermon, and, and some bread and wine, they're good, babe. They're good. But that's not doing a lot for our, our world, let alone our nation, let alone it's just not, it's not helping. It's getting worse. And Islam gets bigger. And, and secular humanism gets bigger. And communism gets bigger. In China, no faith. They're, they're, they're killing everybody. When it has a faith, Catholics, Muslims, that doesn't make any difference. And so what, what effect can we have here? And so we kind of look at our age and say, who's going to pick this mantle up and run? Well, business as usual will not get the job done. Will not. And, and a minor tweak here or there will probably be unnoticeable. We're talking in terms of a magnitude of a, of a next reformation that could possibly be bigger than the first. If we pursued it to at least this level of dimension, if not more. If, when you speak to other views, do they acknowledge their weaknesses? Uh, some do. Yeah, it depends on the person. And it also depends on who's sitting next to him. <laughs> In private, they'll probably acknowledge, yeah, you're right on this, but if I, if I went to my seminary or my church and I, and I mentioned some of this stuff to them, I, I would be out of a job. Tell John, tell them the story about you and R.C. Sproul. Oh, uh, R.C. and I had a fairly decent uh, relationship. He knew how, who I was because of my book, The Apocalypse Conspiracy. And he, he saw me on uh, Larry King Live and all that stuff. And I went to one of his seminars uh, down in uh, Orlando. Uh, I think it was about 98 in that vintage, somewhere around there. And I'd never met him before or talked to him on the phone or anything like that. And, and, and it was, was in the big Baptist church down there where they were holding it. And, and that thing seats 10,000, something like that. And, the, and it was about maybe two-thirds full. And he was speaking, and he was done. And, and then, of course, you know, everybody wants to come up and talk to R RC after it's over. So, so, and I was sitting back and back. So I had to work my way up and, uh, <laughs> and, and wait a long time. And then finally, a, a, a kind of the crowd parted, and I was about from... Oh, here to here to that table, I'd say, from him. I'm standing here like this, and he looks up at me and points at me and says, John Noy, I know you. Oh. And I'm sitting there thinking, What? <laughs> and I said, How do you know me? He said, I read your book, <laughs> The Apocalypse Conspiracy, and your pictures on the back. <laughs> And I'm sitting there, wow. I mean, I was impressed. And we had a great relationship there. We, we'd meet at various Christian Bookseller Association conventions when I was with the International, when I was still with the International Prayers Association. We exhibit there. And, uh, and RC and, and what, what Ligonier Ministries, you know, would, would have their booths there. And RC would be there. And we'd cross paths and talk and everything. And, and then one day he invited me up to a conference room and he said, I want to talk to you. About something, so uh, invited me up and just he, he and I in there, and he, uh, I think I can tell this story, uh, and he, he said, John, I want you to know, oh, this is when he had written his book. What was the name of that book? The Last Days. Last Days According to Jesus. Great book, and that got him in so much trouble in his post millennial, all millennial circles. I mean, a lot of trouble. So it was a good book. Didn't go far enough, but it went. A lot farther than you'd think. But uh, uh, he said, let me tell you something. He says, I have two columns. I have my AD 70 column, 
and then I have my end of time column. And as I've been evolving or developing as a theologian over these years, I find that what's been happening is I've been taking things out of my end of time column and putting them in my time of the end column. And he, sa he said, and then he wagged his finger at me and said, but I want you to know, I still have a few things in my end of time column. And we had a, we had a nice, nice relationship. What, what do you say about he, he, couldn't, he, he couldn't go with it publicly because of... Oh, the, yeah. Yeah, he couldn't go with it say publicly. Say that to him. Say that he couldn't go with it publicly, or he would have been ostracized by his contingencies. He just couldn't. Have you ever it would it would ruin his ministry. Wow. Yeah, I, I call that the Nicodemus. It's like Nicodemus met Jesus, and he still didn't. It ruined his ministry. I mean, well, Rich and I have it. He was of Rich and I have an advantage over RC, is we don't have. <laughs> no, we don't have the problem. <laughs> We don't have that much to lose, right? Yeah. Oh, we, John and I were talking this morning. Our, we don't have, you know, we're 20 people, people. We, we don't have a Bill Hybels, Willow Creek. We don't have a Parkview Church. With, we, got, we got 20 people here. And so we were talking how many years has John has been in, in the ministry. And neither one of us have a thriving, huge ministry. We, we just don't have those numbers. Why? So I asked John, you think we're wrong? God hasn't blessed us? That, are, we, are, we, are, we, are we wrong because we're not in an auditorium of 10,000 tonight? You'd be surprised how often that has been labeled and lodged against me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. By, so by, let's explain it to him. So. By, by higher ups. Right. Well, obviously, you couldn't be right or God would be blessing. See, you you would have a ministry like mine, yeah. mine being his. He said, Thomas said most most people left Jesus, so <laughs> yeah, he he didn't have a big ministry either, did he? <laughs> hey John, did you try to go to market to to go into the churches and to do the thirteen weeks? How much have you tried to go around and? They don't want you, or no. invitation doesn't come, or no, they don't. They don't. They don't want it. And, and if they wouldn't do anything, they would do it with their people who they trust and could count on to to toe the line. So to bring bring in an outside gunslinger like me uh, would be would be hazardous <clears throat> to their further employment. <laughs> The elders would not shine kindly on that. That's the nature of what we got here. What is the audience size of Christianity today? How many people get that magazine either in digital or print? I don't know. I don't know. Have you ever thought of self-publishing? Oh, yeah. What do you think that is? This is all self-published. That's my publishing company, East to West Press. Okay. Tell them about John Hagee. Yeah. Tell them, tell them about John Hagee when you went to Nash, uh, 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 that press company in Nashville Nelson, Nelson. and you tried to get your book sold. What happened? Uh, well, Thomas Nelson published my book, People know. Power, back in 80, what was that? 84, then it went mass market in 86. And uh, I approached him with uh, the Apocalypse Conspiracy book to do it. And John and I found out later, and they declined. And, uh, and I found out later from some inside sources that John Hagee had found out that they were considering publishing a book by me and, and that book. Mm -hmm. and, and, he, and they had been publishing him, and his books sell a lot. A lot you know, people want to get scared to death about how, or, or promised to death about how close Jesus is coming is, and we're soon going to get out of here, and everything will be hunky dory, and we won't have to mess with. You know various things, and uh, he said if 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 they published John knowing, he would never publish another book with them again, and that killed it, killed it dead. Do you understand the power? Do you understand the power of this this religion or this faith or whatever it is? Do you understand? This is real. And now you look at a man, you know, matured out, 
and all the experience that he's had, what he's been through, right? Th this is real. So like I always tell you guys, you better be careful when you walk out that door with what you've learned in here because it, it will cut you. It will, you, if you want to open up your mouth, you can, but as the, as Ron's video of Brian with the, <laughs> what that was, that was so funny, right? Be, be careful, right? So I'm not afraid to tell you I, my faith and my eschatology, I don't have, I'm, I'm okay. But I would never go into a church and bring this up because there's no fruit. You, you know, you can't, you can't, you get hurt, you get, you, well, string you up, lose your job, well, right? If, yeah, if you're in a paid position, but if we're a, a lay person or whatever, I mean, let it fly. I mean, what, what, what if, well, if you get to the point where we don't have anything to lose either, you know, being able to do the truth, I mean, that's what we're called to do, you know? No, so right. exactly. a lot of us are semi-retired or retired or whatever, what do we have to lose? I mean, you know, yeah. they're, gonna, they're not going to. Some church is not going to cut me out financially because they don't support me anyway. So why not? Why not try anyway? I mean, that's one, one thing you lose is friends because I've lost friends. This is the only friend I need right here, Jason. My wife. My wife. She always yeah. agrees with me. Because she knows I'm right. John, let me go. Let me go through the slide because there's a few things I want you to bring up to the the group. Okay. Um, could could you give your views on Armageddon? <laughs> I was there. Uh, you were there. Now explain, <laughs> but tell the group what, what a happened. show! What a show that was! You know, Armageddon. Armageddon. Go ahead. Well, everybody's heard about the Battle of Armageddon, right? Soon coming over in Israel, and with all the stuff that's going on now, could happen next week, right? Or or real soon? I mean, we've been kicking the Armageddon thing around for decades. Maybe even longer than that, wouldn't you think, Rich? Well, when I was in Israel, uh, I went in 93 with Pat and Shirley Boone and 400 of his other close friends <laughs> on four or five buses. And we went all over, place, all over the place seeing where Jesus did this and that in fulfillment of this or that prophecy and did this or that in fulfillment of this or that prophecy and all that kind of stuff. And our Jewish guide was telling us uh, you know, ask him any questions that he wants, but but just know that he's not a Christian. But uh, you know, he knows about all this history stuff and things like that. And and so finally, I got a chance to walk up after we'd been to many places. We're seeing where Jesus did this or that, and fulfillment of this. A little or that louder, prophecy. John. A little louder. That, this or that prophecy. And uh, and I I said, do you really believe that? He said, oh yeah, oh yeah, I really believe that Jesus did that, did this or that, and in fulfillment of this or that prophecy. And I said, then, then why, this, this or that messianic prophecy, excuse me, said, this or that messianic prophecy. I said, then why don't you believe he was, he's the Messiah? And he said, because Jesus didn't fulfill them all. And I said, yes, he did. He said, what? He said, oh, yeah, I did. Want me to show you or tell you? He said, no. <laughs> Turned around and walked away. Armageddon. 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 So, so we're on the bus, and we're going to Armageddon. It's uh, 50 miles north of, uh, approximately, 50 miles north of Jerusalem. Uh, it's a valley. It's about, I think, 20 miles long by 10 miles wide, something like that. they got this little bitty anthill that you, know, you can drive up on, and you can over where they where Park the bus. Anybody been there? You, 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 okay. And you can see it and so forth like that. And they tell you this is where the great battle of the great and mighty day of the Lord is going to take place any day now. And, uh, and, uh, and you know, and, and that's, it's a big tourist draw. I mean, people drive all the way out of Jerusalem, all the way up there, go a long way just to see that. It'd be like going down to Brown County. You know, and looking out, you've been to Brown County in, in Indiana? Down, well, I don't know, maybe you haven't done it, but the places. You know, I mean, it's no big deal. I mean, it's a big, it's a big valley, where it is. Well, just to give you an idea of how far off 
the whole Armageddon thing is? The only place it's mentioned is in the book of Revelation. And it's the valley of Har Megiddo. Har. Har. Did I say it wrong? No. That Har. I want them to hear it. Har. Har Megiddo. Two words. Two words. Well, what is the... And, and they tell us it's going to take place in the valley. That one that we just were visiting on the bus? It's going to take place on the valley. What is the opposite word from a valley? That's what Har means. Har. Say, say it again. I don't think they got it. Har means mountain. The battle takes place on a mountain, not on a valley. And Megiddo, the Greek for Megiddo, is assembly. Well, back in Jesus' day, where in the world was the mount of, of assembly. assembly? And what did Jesus say was going to happen to that? There's going to be a battle. And not one stone will be left on another. And when you start seeing Jerusalem surrounded by armies, get out of town. I mean, big deal in Jesus' Olivet Discourse prophecy. <coughs> well, that's how far off, and that's what, exactly what happened. Within, barely, barely, I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass away until all these things have happened. It all happened then. And that's the Mount Har of assembly that was totally destroyed. But when you read Revelation, it says R A R M Ma Geddon, Armageddon. And you think it's a place when you read it. But when you don't get into the translation eras of it, to bring up Har means a, a place. Megiddo, Har, Megiddo, Armageddon. You can see how that word has morphed over eons, over time, over decades, hundreds of years. And so we get a, a, an interpretation of that word in our context. And we completely miss what it was originally meant. Hmm. Do you see that? Lawrence? Comments? I actually said that last week. You know, it's amazing how theologians, expositors, do the mental gymnastics to, to uh, do away with the generation will not pass away until all, things, all of these things have happened. How many, how many theologians and how many commentators? Yeah, you've really it, it's it's exegetical gymnastics oh, yes. that just work out of that. No, right? Ex exegetical gymnastics all over the place, including sticking in gaps of time where there's absolutely no textual justification for doing that whatsoever. Just arbitrary. Dave, you have a comment? A couple of things. Just wanted to say personally, thanks for making the trip up here and, and for sharing with us. Thank you. Very Thank much you for coming. You bring an awful lot to the plate, for sure. Um, then two questions. Why do you think, why do you think in 2,000 years nobody else has come up with a synthesis of different views? I have no idea because I wasn't there. All I know was I had to prove to my doctoral committee that nobody had ever done this before. And I had to do it through an extensive uh, uh, research study, uh, uh, you know, of pre previous works, and, and 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 that's why some of the things that I read you there, you know, help justify that it wasn't just me saying this, but others have said this. So this literature review study I, I had to be approved by my doctoral committee, and and they didn't think I could pull it off. They said we'll prove it because no, you're right, it hasn't been done before, and you pretty well documented, you know, a number of theologians who recognize that. And, uh, but we don't think you'll be able to pull it off. Well, two and a half years later, they signed off on it. And one of them said, don't ever associate my name with this. With this. And, and a, a follow-up question. Um, do you see any future or any unfulfilled prophecies that you say you, you hold to a futurist view on some things? What's next? Do you see anything still unfulfilled? Nope. That's why we contend for the faith that was, once for all, delivered to the saints as we had been instructed. And back then, is when it, when it all took place, 
<coughs> and it's just been increasing, expanding, growing. Not lessening. Let me let me respond to David too. There are a lot of predators out there. There are a lot of different factions, different different things. Hmm. And John and I were talking about whether we were going to bring up some of those names tonight, right? And John says, "No, nah, Rick, we don't want to bring those names up, right?" Well, there's a lot of predators out there, famous people, right? And R.C. Sproul is one of them, but not a not a he doesn't push it because it's, it's dangerous, right? But there are a lot of people who have this this view, but there's no one. We don't have a we don't have a Moody Bible Institute pushing this stuff. We don't have a Dallas pushing preterism. We don't have it. It's it's a fragmented group of people who who like Jason, right? He's, he he grabs this stuff, and we see them. John and I see them all over the place, right? But there's no unified group of body. And we have talked about getting a try to get the predators to all meet someplace. Uh, that's likely not going to happen. Why? Because what do they do? They fight. They, they fight. They just, well, your view of preterism is the wrong view. My view of what and, and what's the fruit of that? What, what would, when we talked about this, we were sitting around in chairs today. We we're talking about, do we want to bring up these, these guys, right? Well, it's, it's almost, it's Fruit, fruitless. Well, I think the problem is, I think, I kind of meant, talked about it a little bit before, is to have a consortium, because you can't just get the preterists together. You got to get a preterist, you got to get a, an amil, a post mill, a displacement. You got to get one from each camp and put them together, be able to create some kind of, to continue what you started here, create um, research papers and, and, uh, you know, a, a competitor for Christianity today, I know there's a couple out there, I was just Googling around on it, um, where there's a forum for people like yourself and other people. Uh, that is somewhat present with the Evangelical Theological Society, which I've been a member of that since 94. Uh, mm -hmm. And then presented over, uh, uh, I believe it's 19, or almost, same number, I think it's about 19, Papers, although some of them I pre presented at both the national and the regionals, so there's an overlap there. Uh, that is allowable there, but it's pretty stagnated, though, uh, you know, along Amil and dispensational lines, and uh, and they know who the Amils are and who the who the uh, Dispies are, and, and then there's me, and uh, I I had a I did a paper on Israel. Once down at Opryland, the, the regional meeting down there, and had about seventy, I would say seventy theologians in there, and it was almost like parting the Red Sea. You could see, you could see the Amillennials on one side and the Dispensationals on the other side. The Amills loved it, and it came up and just said, uh, you know, how, how much? And the and the and the Dispensationalists stomped out. Yeah, it's because you know it has to deal with their sin of ego and pride and flesh and, and job protection, and well, job. job security, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And then the, the the cognitive dissonance they experience when hearing these other views, they they're so locked in, they're so gripped on to death grip, so yeah. their view like, just is. Hmm. So John, can you tell us? Can you give us a little bit of something that you would consider to be a success, success, success throughout your 40 years or so, and something that you feel like maybe you even failed at and you're disappointed about, again, with your 40 years of study, writing books. And if that's too personal. You I'll, know, I'll give you a big one. Happen, pardon me? I'll give you a big one. Happened last week. My daughter was appointed by the governor of the state of Indiana to be the new state comptroller. And we had the swearing in ceremony, and I was sitting there, <laughs> you know, just thoroughly relishing the whole thing. It was just, it was just fabulous. And she, she deserves it. She, she's something else. She's something else. Yeah, that, that was quite an experience. So the blessing wasn't 
theologically based, <laughs> wasn't faith based, but look at the joy he saw in his daughter having the fourth highest position at the state of Indiana. That's a blessing. And he could take that and kind of, this has something to do with that. You can't say that the faith and the work of John Noe hasn't had some type of impact on his offspring. Right? Well, right? she had to go through quite a process of interviewing and being go through security tests, checks, and all sorts of stuff. like. And we did, too. We had to go through, and we couldn't tell anybody. And and there were other contenders, you know, that were we, they were told we didn't weren't told who they were or whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the things that the the governor mentioned uh, in his uh, when he he spoke at our swearing in ceremony, which was held in the atrium right outside his office of the Indiana State House, a gorgeous facility there. And uh, one of the things he said is Indiana has a very strong conservative and well-financed finan state run, run really well. Sorry about you guys. <laughs> but it's really run really well. And part, and part of what her vision is, something we don't know. <laughs> her vision is, is not, not to be an office manager. Her vision is, to, and, and by the way, she had been the president of the Boone County Council, which was the big uh, uh, county next to uh, where Indianapolis is down there. President of the Indiana Council of States or of uh, counties, and she, she and she'd been on that for eight, seven, or eight years, and done all sorts of stuff. And uh, uh, her vision is that there's other states that are well run financially, and we're going. And her vision is to hook all, all those up into a a group and to influence and shame. The state, the, the national government, in getting their financial house in order, and have that pressure come from gr a growing group of states. Now that's that's a heck of a heck of a big objective, with a lot of problems associated with it, as you can probably imagine. So, uh, but she is so articulate, and I mean, she had the she had the crowd. I mean, I mean, she's just so dynamic. It's just and and sincere, and loving and kind. And I don't know where she gets it from. <laughs> Probably her mother. <laughs> yeah, you know, obviously. Well, she sounds like a trailblazer, like her father. Well, she she is. She is. She is, she is in a different way. But yet that ties in here. That ties in because we each have to find out. Where can we be effective? Rather than sitting around doing this. Where can we be effective in the, time, in the time that we have left and so forth? And I would appreciate if you know an influencer who, who this information might be of interest to that, that you would tell him or her. And see if see if some other doors might be able to open for Mitch to talk to or, or me or or whoever. Go go to our YouTube channel, uh, greater than we believe. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about our Christian faith is greater than we believe, and that's the name of our YouTube channel. We have over two hundred and twenty half an hour teaching. As we summarize this up, it it this really isn't about eschatology. It's not about preterism, dispensationalism, futurism, amillennial, postmillennial, rapture. It, that's not what this is about. Okay. This is about understanding Jesus as greater than what you probably have thought him to be. Mm -hmm. Right? So when you look at eschatology, that's just an example of who our God, who we worship, is. And what I wanted you to get out of this eschatology thing is not so much eschatology. I want you to understand how great this Jesus is that he, he can be in two places in one time. It's possible. He, 
He can do anything he wants. And I know we've said that before. And I know he's given all power and authority. You've read it a hundred times in your Bibles, right? You've read it. And it's a nice thing to read. But it hasn't sunk in yet. Uh, it hasn't sunk in for me, but it, it's sinking in. And I'm beginning to realize, oh, this, this, this Jesus, he is really greater than I believe. He is well beyond Christmas. Now we're going to celebrate Christmas this Saturday, the 23rd. We're going to have a great time. We're going to have communion. We're going to have fun. And we're going to, and two days later, we're going to have the Christmas party. And they're going to open a present, blah, 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 blah. But like John said, that Jesus isn't there anymore. That Jesus in the, in the cradle, he, he ain't there. He's not like that anymore. He's not there anymore. What is he? Oh, man, he's so much greater. So as Dan brought up the question to John, during that process of, well, I have to go to the Father, don't touch me yet, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's just a, a, a period of time. But you look at where Jesus is now, oh, he's much greater mm. than we believe. He's the greater Jesus, he, he's, he's unveiled himself. And I want you to start thinking along those lines. And not just thinking it, I want you to believe it. I want you to believe that he, he is manifestable. He is appearable. He is, as Ron says, sovereign all the time. You throw that out a lot, okay? Okay, that he, he really is. Just, and, and just believe that. So I didn't want this thing to be about, I didn't want to be about Noe. I didn't want it to be about eschatology. I want you to come away from a view to summarize this and say, oh, I get it now. He's greater than what I believed. That's what I wanted you to get. Louis Burkhoff, 1937, in his classic book, The History of Christian Doctrine, uh, noted this. He said, the doctrine of last things never stood in the center of attention is one and now by the way as of 1948 that changed big time <coughs> uh, it may be as dr Orr summarizes we have now reached the point in the history of dogma in which the doctrine of last things will receive greater attention and be brought to further development burkoff also concluded that quote Eschatology is even now the least developed of all the loci of dogmatics, end quote. Conspicuously, no creedal council ever debated eschatology. Even the 16th century reformers spent little time with it. Hokusma granted that, quote, at the time of the Reformation, eschatology did not receive its proper place and attention in dogmatics. Spikeman added, Luther, however, dealt with the doctrine of last things in only fragmentary ways. Calvin, too, gave it only passing attention. Noteworthy among his voluminous writings is the absence of a commentary on the book of Revelation. Far-reaching conclusions are often drawn from this omission, including indictments of an alleged eschatological impoverish impoverishment in the Calvinistic tradition. And here we are today, still exalting that stuff. All right, let's close this up. Jason, what do you got to say? Two cents. Go ahead. What do you got? Uh, again, thank you, John, for coming up, and thank you for who you are and, and how the Lord has chosen you to do this and that you're faithful to your calling, very faithful to your calling, and Rick also. Thank you. Thank you. Lawrence, uh, I agree with you in, in one respect. I, I believe that the right way to look at this is uh, with synthesis of the different views. I just come at it from a different perspective, but I'm, I appreciate you coming and um, always open to hear another view and learn. Crystal. Yeah, same. I thank you, too. Um, it was... A little louder. It was good because you weren't boring, so thank you. <laughs> well, he, I like you too, he so threatened me good. not to. Yeah. Be, uh, don't be boring. Yeah, you weren't, so thank you for coming all the way out. I'm just happy that I don't have to fit in a box. 
it just helps me with all the things that through my life that got me to this point. So now I'm happy I don't have to be in problems. Don, thank you. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Ron, what do you got? Was there a time, I'm thinking back, um, okay, so 2000, early 2000s when you came up with your doctoral uh, thesis and dissertation, when did, at what point in your life did you, were you once holding one of these other views before you, God enlightened you? What, what, when you grew up as a kid, what kind of view did you and your folks have? Oh no. <laughs> oh no. You, still, you mean you, I just got born and now Jesus is going to come back and end all this? <laughs> so I was an oh no, I didn't know. I didn't know. I just thought, ugh. Yeah. But what, when, when, did, when did the light bulb go off for you? Oh, that's. Oh gosh, I don't know. I, I don't think. Was there a life that. event maybe that changed it or? Um, yeah. Yeah, there was. How much time do I have? <laughs> How much? Do I have uh, three minutes? Go, oh, go, oh, hurry, hurry, hurry. Absolutely. I wrote about it in this book. The Next Great Reformation, 96 New Theses for Reclaiming Jesus' Everlasting Kingdom. Bear with me for a moment. So I didn't have it queued up. Okay, where is it? Uh, all right. When I originally contemplating writing this second edition, I never intended to go public with this next personal story. Some people may be troubled by it, but I feel compelled to include it. You see, it laid the foundation for the redirection of my life the past 21 years. Does that direct your issue here? Mighty revival coming your way, in, in capital letters, the sign announced. Prophetic teaching, words of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. The newspaper ad proclaimed, bring the sick, witness with your own eyes the miracle power of the healing Christ. I'd never seen or heard anything like this in my church. Could it be genuine or was it a fraud? I had to find out for myself. Don't go, my conservative Christian friends warn me. You'll just contaminate your ministry. In retrospect, they were right. Somehow I knew that if I went, I'd no longer be able to settle for the common, the ordinary, the dull, or the spectator role in life uh, in my area of faith. Maybe it was my well-preserved sense of childlike wonder and adventurous spirit that explained my intense desire to know and to know for sure. I had to stop accepting other people's opinions about something this important. I had to go and see for myself. So on a Friday night in the mid-1980s, full of doubts and a little nervous about the whole thing, my wife and I drove down to the mighty revival being held in the Indianapolis Convention Center. The room was only half full. We entered the back and sat about halfway down next to the center aisle. I reckoned about 75 to 100 people were in attendance. Please understand something very important. We didn't know a soul, and they didn't know us either. The meeting was totally different from anything I'd ever witnessed. People jumping, shouting, singing, dancing, waving their hands. People in our church didn't act that way. After the sermon, toward the end of the service, the preacher asked everyone to close their eyes and bow their head. And he began to talk and began to walk around the meeting room all the time ministering in a booming voice to various people. He told them personal things and intimate details about their lives and about, their, about people in their family. I figured he probably knew them. But he didn't know us. A short time later, I could hear his voice coming up the center aisle, and he was talking about the Apostle John in the Bible, and walked right past me. Then he stopped and turned around and walked back and stood beside me. My eyes were still closed and my head dutifully bowed. The next thing I knew, he grabbed my left hand and raised it straight up in the air like this and held it in his hand, all the while talking about the Apostle John. And in a loud voice, I can hardly read in a loud voice that all, in a loud voice that everyone could hear. Suddenly, he stopped speaking to the group and squeezed my hand and addressed me personally, John, John. 
John, God has given you special revelation of Scripture, and you are to teach others. You, to a lot of people in your family, John, I sat frozen in my cheap seat like this, because he still has his hand in my hand. Uh, eyes still dutifully closed and head bowed, my hand held high in the air by his. Next, almost without missing a breath, he started talking about Noah. God had another great son, Noah, he roared. My mind flashed back to the first time my father told my little brother and I that our family name was in the Bible. We figured he was kidding, but he wasn't. He showed us the King James Version of the New Testament where Noah's name is written as Noe, which is my last name. It was written, you know, it was written as Noe. Again, he squeezed my hand and in a loud voice declared, John Noah, receive this anointing. I still couldn't believe what I was hearing. He had put the two names of the two biblical characters he had been talking about together, and it was my name. Wow, could this be, I thought. I was certainly, it was certainly more than a coincidence. Stop resisting it, he admonished me while squeezing my hand even harder. Receive this anointing. Then it was over, and he let go of my hand and walked back up the aisle toward the front and began speaking to somebody else. Please understand, once again, I didn't know him. He didn't know me. Furthermore, no one in the room knew me or my wife. I don't know how you would have felt, but I didn't know what to think. I was in somewhat of a daze. Slowly, I leaned over to my wife and whispered to her, Hey, you know, he was talking about me. He was holding my hand. And she said, Yes, I knew. <laughs> and I said, I said how, did, how did you know? She said, I peeked. <laughs> if that wasn't enough, about ten minutes later, the preacher leaned over from the top, went back to the front of the room, the top of the podium, podium uh, and it's behind his pulpit and pointed down over the top of the rows, about 12 back to us, and called my wife out by name too. He bellowed out for all to hear, Cindy, the fire of God is going up and down your back and you are being healed this very moment and you are to teach too. Needless to say, our drive home that night was anything but normal. I could hardly breathe when he was talking to me, she relented. It felt like a giant weight was on my chest the whole time. Whatever happened, actually happened that night to my wife and me at the Mighty Revival, one thing is sure. It was an event that was so remarkable, so unbelievable, so yet so real that we could not dismiss it. Years later, I am better able to understand that this experience was my first dramatic encounter with what many consider to be the supernatural. That night, my wife and I had tasted a reality that is denied or ignored by most of our Bible Belt friends and close advisors. But at the time, I wondered, was this of God? Or was it a fraud, a cult, or spiritism? Now I'm convinced it was from God. Surprisingly, with a, with a bang, I had tapped into a new, different, and exciting dimension. It forever changed the way I thought of myself, understood God's Word, the Bible, and saw the world around me. Yes, it was like donning another set of eyeglasses through which I began to examine all I had been taught. Supernaturally, the spirit of wisdom and revelation began to flow through me as never before, Ephesians 1.17, as many of you know. The eyes of my heart grew more and more enlightened, Ephesians 1.18, Ever since this experience at the mighty revival, I have often found myself contemplating what was it that God had called John Noah to teach others and to a lot of people and to your family. Yes, I recommend that. <laughs> Kathy? Oh, just thank you for coming. That was an awesome. That was awesome. Great testimony. Yes. Miss yes. Synthesis Girl. Thank you for your knowledge and sharing your personal experiences tonight. Very appreciative. Right. Great job, John. Excellent. Thank you. Hey. Uh, thanks for coming down. Uh, your books were eye-opening. I appreciated uh, reading those things and uh, those two. Uh, one quick question that I'd, I'd like to get your opinion on. Th this idea of the post-millennial, pre-millennial, that supposes that there's a thousand year reign. And that's, is that taking Revelation literal? Yes. I mean, 
Yes, that's taken Revelation literally. Yeah, so if you, I mean, what if you thought the book of Revelation was not literal but more symbolic? Or are there parts that are literal and parts that are? I mean, how do you kind of discern between the two? Well, that is a huge discussion, <laughs> needless yeah. to say. Uh, and not easily answered in a, in a one or two yeah. sentence. But, but, you, you would but it's, a, it's, a book, it's a book that's filled with signs and symbols. So chances are, whatever it is you're looking at there, chances are it is a sign and a symbol of a literal reality. It's not a, not a sign and a symbol of an unliteral reality. It, yeah, so, so that particular part you might take literally, the other parts you might take more symbolically, depending on... Yeah, like cutting your hand off. What, what, you know, how do you take that? Literally yeah. or okay. spiritually? Okay. I suggest spiritually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Revelation is, is an apocalyptic book. It's to be read in, in, in not like a literal book. It's just not, it's, it's yeah. not the book it is. It's just not yeah. that genre. Yeah. And so you have to consider metaphorical words and, and hyperbole and what are some other ones, Kathy? I don't know. But you have to, you, you can't just read it in a, 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 a literal way. That is a way to read it. Is it the correct way? No. No, it's not. Yeah, I, I just question whether there is a thousand year. I, I'm not sure there is. I don't think so. But How many hills does God own the cattle on? <laughs> How many hills are there in the world? So, how many does he own the cattle on? Oh, oh. Oh. Yeah. Jane, what do you got? That's, good. That's a really good analogy, I guess. Thank you so much for coming and uh, just, you know, just mind expanding and um, so interesting. And I'm looking forward Again, to Again, look at get the books. Go, yes. to the, go, go to the YouTube, Greater yeah. Than We Believe. Yeah. Looking My co host, forward. Steve King, and I. You'll, you'll love him. I'm looking you, you have to put up with me, but you'll love him. <laughs> Isn't that right, Jason? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I don't right. think you're boring either. So. <laughs> Not anything but boring. I have thoroughly enjoyed this evening what we've heard. One question that I have been milling around in my mind is this. We have talked about the Bible and the correct interpretation of the original languages do we need the interpretation or the translation the translation yes okay. the translation okay do we need a new translation in the english that we have today or do we have it yes and no <laughs> okay <laughs> we need it there there are problems there are problems. Now, that doesn't mean you throw the whole thing out. No. Uh, we, we do, on, in greater than we believe, we, we talk about the top 10 mistranslations in the Bible that are significant. And I talk about how many angels can dance on the head of a pen, that kind of stuff. But that are significant. We do the top 10. You know, you know how many we had in our top 10? How, how, many, how many schools are in the Big Ten? <laughs> huh? 15. I think that's what we came up with. <laughs> so our top 10 has 13 in it or something like that. If I remember right, yeah. But, but those, those are what we call the biggies. And then that's on greater than we believe on those videos.